I thank the Lord for being made sin for us. As I contemplated this, this is um this is a means of great humility. When you see the depths that God and Christ have gone in order that his eternal purpose might be fulfilled in the earth must be a grand eternal purpose that would require such a thing as this. Never in the history of the world has there been a stark of a contrast than what occurred that day on the tree. You had the light of the world that was being made sin. Now, many throughout the history of the church have tried to relate this story in their own words, but we'll find that the revelation that God has provided in the scriptures concerning his dear son emphasizes it best, says it best. The Holy Spirit says it best. Now, as men labor in the word and the doctrine, they are given grace by God to be able to open up, to be able to emphasize the things that need to be emphasized concerning his dear son. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You can't do better than the word of God. Now, if you're talking about sensitive matters such as these, I found that I would do well to stick close to the things that God has said about his son. So that you don't go further than God went, and you don't stop short of what God did. When you're talking about the death of his son, with preciseness has got to be the key. You've got to say it the way God said it, if you want the effects that God's determined to have in them that hear the word spoken. Amen. The words of Godly contemporary men, although I personally believe many of which are inspired, they do not have the same weight or depth which is contained in the revelatory ministry of the apostles of Christ. Amen. The apostles said it best. Yes. Amen. They were given a larger place in the kingdom. They were given more trials. They were given a, a, a place in the foundation of the kingdom of God. Well, it would make sense then that their inspiration would be, would be um, up to, to that standard, that God would be using them in a particular way, in a specific manner, which would require specific words. Mm -hmm. You know, everything you know is prompted by a word, something somebody said. That's just the way we are. We're made in the image of God, so it would not surprise me that we would need a word from God if we're going to see him clearly, the words of God are, are meant to be taken and, and eaten up, ingested, imbibed. You, they become a part of you. And as they become a part of your thinking, you're going to view the death of Christ differently. As you see him more precisely, the death of Christ will become more significant in your mind. What God did to Christ on our behalf, primarily I want to focus on why he did it. I'm going to have um, several points here. But in salvation, God has abundantly exposed his nature. In other words, you can see who God is more clearly when you start understanding what, what salvation is, what it means. Amen. That's what he's provided it for. He has manifested that nature in and through those who he has redeemed and placed them in the person of his son. Why did he do that? Why did God redeem you? Well, it's not just for you. It's the church is a spectacle of angels. So right off the bat, you know, it's not all about you. You're a part of it. Praise God. But it's for it's a bigger purpose than ever could just be manifested in you. But as you take part of the whole, you find, you find your relevance as you are in Christ Jesus. 
When God, speaking as a man, set out to make himself known unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, he knew that this project salvation would involve subjecting himself to immeasurable sorrow. He, was, he made him to be sin for us. Can we measure the amount of sorrow that God subjected himself to when he made him to be sin? God loved him. He loved him. And he made him to be sin. In order for God to show the depths of his mercy, he'd have to have creatures that needed mercy. If God were going to open up the fact that he's long-suffering and forgiving, he would have to endure being subjected to those who were in need of forgiveness. God would have to be patient, long-suffering to those who didn't deserve it now. There was nothing, not one reason that we could give God to do this. He of his own self, his own right arm brought salvation because he was working a purpose. So, in the wisdom and predetermination of God, he made man from the dust of the earth, <laughs> the lowest element he made man. Why? Because he was going to show that it's not of man. It's not by works of the flesh. God is the God of salvation. Now, you know, this is evident once you're in Christ and you start looking around, you, God starts opening things up to you. You say, well, of course, it's not by works of righteousness that I've done. It's what Christ did on that cross. That's why I am what I am by the grace of God. Man, although made in the image of God, was not made impervious to trial or temptation. Although innocent and fully sinless, Adam and Eve were fully sinless, you couldn't lay anything to their charge when they were made, right? They were perfect. They were sinless. We know this to be true. God made them. God is not full of sin. God made them. They were sinless. And yet the first time they were tempted, they fell. This is saying a lot. Why am I going through this? Because there's, there's, I'm trying to build a foundation from which he's going to be made sin. This one that was totally sinless and perfect. Even though man was made sinless and perfect, he wasn't made complete. Amen. We know this to be true because later God himself would say it's not good for man to be alone. What He needed something, so he wasn't complete. So he would take from man a rib, and he would make a woman. And together, they would stand as man. An image that God would begin working in. God made the man with the capacity to fall. I know some people don't like that, but it's the reality. They fell. It wasn't by accident. They had a capacity to fall. Of course, this by no means imputes God with causing the fall. They fell. They fell. Well, now God has someone to recover. Now God can be gracious. Now God can, this, this whole project salvation can get underway now. First thing God's going to do is going to show that man can't do it alone. Just look, at, just look at what happens when God withdraws himself from humanity. Not very long and the, every thought and ma imagination of their heart is only evil continually. So if people ever think, well, I wish God would just leave me alone, they need to read the first few chapters of Genesis. And you see, this is what happens when God leaves people alone. We don't want God to leave us alone. We want, we want God to, to work in us, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. As a child, I can recall asking questions within myself as to why God made man so vulnerable. Why didn't you, it, it, why didn't you just bring us to heaven right then? Well, obviously, I was foolish and unlearned. I knew that God was capable of doing whatever he wanted, but I hadn't made the connection to God's eternal purpose being worked out in the earth. This is what God's doing. Later, I realized that if Christ was a lamb slain before the foundation of the, 
of the world, then the creation of both Lucifer and Adam were no coincidence at all. God was working. God's doing his will, both in the heavens and in the earth. Why did God allow Lucifer to fall? Well, he's going to have an adversary. Look what God's going to do with an adversary. He's going to try the faith of the saints. He's going to fully test them to where someday when we end up there, we're going to be adequate to the work. So you're going to be ready. Believe me, you walk with Christ very long and you'll become very, very discomforted with this present evil world. You'll be longing and looking forward to a time when you're sinless, absolutely perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, I praise God for that, that hope. See, that hope, if it's a living in you, it'll mandate that you stop sinning. All of the cre created order, in some sense and in some way, is connected to the eternal purpose of God. God hasn't made anything as an accessory. Everything is connected to what God's doing. Now, either you're talking about Pharaoh or you're talking about Abraham. It's all connected. God's working his will in the earth. Now, we find it. In scripture, that God's plan for Pharaoh wasn't quite the same as it was for Abraham. But nonetheless, God was reigning in that situation. Why do I say all this? Because God was reigning when Jesus was hanging on the cross, too. God has revealed, has a revealed purpose that is actively, actively working in all people, whether it's whether they're vessels of honor that are being fitted for glory or they're vessels of dishonor, which are being fitted for destruction. Either way, God's involved. So we're going to have to someday bow the knee and, and acknowledge that truth, that it was you. It was you. Now, the saints, we know, will cast our crowns at his feet. We'll acknowledge that it was you in us. It was you bringing us the whole way. Every involvement that God has had or will have or has had in the past with fallen man depends on Christ removing sin. Every promise of God unto man hinges on the work of Christ when he hung on the tree. If Christ doesn't take sin away, then God will be proved to be a liar. Now, I know this, this, this sounds strong, but this is the truth. God must be justified in all of his doings. He told, he told Adam and Eve and the devil that he was going to remove this, right? Promised Abraham he was going to be a blessing to all nations. God is justified at the cross. Sins removed. And actually, it opens the door for God to do something he's wanted to do all along. Amen. To bless men. For he hath made him, that's God, hath made Jesus, who is the Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, briefly, I'm going to have six points because, and I, I pruned that down quite a bit. God is the one that made Jesus to be sin. This is what God did. We're going to talk about what God did. God did not make Jesus to be a sinner. Amen. Jesus did not ever sin. Jesus submitted to being made sin, and I'm going to say primarily because of his love for God. It was the joy set before him that constrained him to go to the cross, not you. Amen. God made Jesus' soul an offering for sin to fulfill his eternal purpose. The righteousness of God is only found in Christ Jesus. Now, my first point, God made Jesus to be sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us. So you could get out of that that Jesus went to the cross for me, right? Well, we're going to see 
a little bit later that it was God that made him to be sin. It was Jesus was the one who submitted to being made to be sin. And um, it's quite revealing when you see exactly what happened. Jesus submitted to the Father. Uh, Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And we might add that neither does the mind of the flesh have the capacity to fully understand imputation or propitiation. Man can't understand this without the Holy Spirit. You can't really understand what happened at the cross as a natural man. If man is going to be saved from the fallen condition, then God must intercede. In other words, no one's ever going to wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to follow God. I think I'm going to follow God. I think, you know, I've heard a lot about this, and I think today I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and give my life to Christ. We say, well, I know people that that happened to. Well, there was a lot of work that happened before that. God was interceding a lot longer than you know before that man ever came to the knowledge that he needed to repent. Paul comments on the seriousness of this condition in Romans 5, 6. It says, for when we were yet without strength, in other words, we didn't have any strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now remember back briefly to the time when you were ungodly. You were without hope. You were without strength. There wasn't any way possible for you to come to Christ on your own. But now remember, keep that thought in your mind, when God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Remember Sarah's in the tent and she laughed. How can I have a son? I'm past the age. This is impossible. It's just as impossible as it was for you to come to Christ. It's impossible. You are without strength. Now, I tell you, how much strength does a dead man have? Because that's how much strength you had. You were dead in trespasses and sins. There wasn't any way for you to come to Christ. He had to intercede. Christ had to be the propitiation. He had to be the one that you had to come through. Now, how's that going to happen? God's going to have to give you to Christ. This is what's going to happen. Now, I, I, I say that not, not anyone, anyone that God has given to Christ won't know it. It's like, well, I don't know what happened. No, if God gave you to Christ, Christ is a good teacher. He's a good teacher. He'll bring you up to speed. Christ will do this. He'll, he'll bring you along. And before you know it, now you say, well, Brother Bob, are you saying we're not involved? Well, no, that isn't what I said. But at that time, you were without Christ, Christ, without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And is that the way you are right now? What happened? God gave you the Christ. That's what happened. He gave you the Christ. And look at look how good of a teacher Christ is. You know why you're in Christ. You know a whole lot more now than when you did the first day you came into Christ. How is that possible? Christ trained you. He's teaching you. He's transforming you into the image. For when and at that time are references to the fact that there was a span of time when all men were hopeless and destitute. Now, it doesn't make any difference who you are. There was a span of time when you were in absolute need. And if God hadn't interceded at that moment, you'd still be there. You'd still be without hope. So what happened? Well, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye, you were sometimes who were far off are made nigh, I like this reference, by the blood of Christ. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the effects of Christ being made sin. In other words, everything hinges on this happening. If Christ isn't made sin while he's hanging on a tree and, and he takes it away, 
then we're all still in our sins. So, I mean, no matter how much religion you got, how pretty it all may seem, and how big the church is, and how comfortable the pews are, if Christ doesn't take away sin, we're all going to be cast into the lake of fire Amen. with the devil and his angels. It's going to happen. And yet, God, see, He's He's purpose. He's purpose, an eternal purpose, one that involved taking away sin and bringing us to glory. Well. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Well, God speaks, speaks to Isaiah to give us the divine perspective concerning the death of Christ. And this will probably be referenced more than once in um, Isaiah chapter 53. I'm just going to highlight just a couple of things that have bear directly on him being made sin. God made Jesus to be sent. All we like sheep are gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of who? Us all. As far as the curse, that's, that's the all. Whoever was under the curse, Jesus bears their sin on the cross. That's how far it went. That's how far it had to go. His blood is effective. Okay, Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. For who? For you, for us. For us who? For us who believed. See, there's that aspect of it. Can't be blind to that aspect of it. There's a sense in which he died for the sins of the whole world. And there's a sense in which he died for you. Now, you're blessed as the day when that hits your soul. He died for me. You'll do a lot more when you know that. Please, the Lord. We see that it was, we see what was going on behind the scenes at Calvary. And when you see exactly what was going on in the unseen world, you see, you're starting to see the effect of things. Now we know, and I don't want to minimize what happened to Jesus on the cross. Men did a lot of things to Jesus. They hurt, they hurt him. They took his life in one sense. They were charged with the murder of Jesus. And yet, God made his soul an offering for sin. This is, this is the effective part. When we talk about the blood of Christ, it wasn't the blood drops that hit the ground that day. We're talking about what God did to Jesus that was effective. Amen. Unless God is involved in the death of Christ, imputing the whole sin of the whole world on his shoulders, then Christ's death would not have availed what it has availed. God put sin squarely on the shoulders of Jesus, and he bore it away. Amen. He took it away. I remember this is the one he loved. You know, one man told me, you shouldn't make me feel so bad about this. You should feel as bad as you should feel. Jesus died to take away your sin. It should hurt you to sin. Amen. Who saw Jesus bear the sins of the world? Who looked into the eyes of Jesus? When he was bearing sin. Who looked on the face of Jesus. When he bore iniquity far off. To a land not inhabited. It's my understanding from the scriptures. That only God did. Matthew 27 45. Says now from the sixth hour. There was darkness. Over all the land until the ninth hour. Luke 23, 44 says, and it was about the sixth hour, there was a, a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, unless a person wants to explain how an eclipse can last three hours, I'm shut up to what the Holy Spirit's told me about this event. And the sun was darkened. The veil of the temple was rent in, in the midst uh, during this three-hour period, 
when the light of the world was bearing sin, the sun was darkened for three hours. Even the physical crea creation could not sustain itself. And I, I submit that unless God had held the whole thing together, it would have all perished at this moment. Jesus was being made sin. Oh, can't we fathom the depths occurred on that day? The whole creation would have come crashing down if it had not been for the eternal purpose of God. Jesus was working. You know, he was bearing sin, but he was working the whole time. He was taking away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This word, the word that was God, the word that was with God, had now be, been made to be sin for us. And the light went out. And no man could see Jesus bear sin. God did. It said, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he, he shall bear their iniquities. God saw the travail of Jesus' soul. This was not a distant thing from God. He was right there. And he was satisfied. Now we serve a satisfied God. Sin, you, how, how do you know that Jesus' work was effective? God is satisfied. Now I know that you're probably like me. There's been people in your life that you've tried to satisfy. My father, I, I would have done anything to satisfy. To make him happy, to satisfy him, to please him. When God looked at Jesus bearing sin, he was satisfied. Amen. I can imagine he's well done. Yeah. Well done, son. Well done. I couldn't have imagined it being done any better than this. You took away sin. You know, this was the thing that was in the way. And he took it out of the way. So now, oh, look at, a, look at how happy God is. Can I speak like a man? He's happy with his son because he's opened up the door to blessing. He's opened up the door to where God can do all of his will. Sin had been put away. Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I'll divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. In that garden the night before, this was, talk about strong cryings. He is saying, Father, if there be any other way, any other way. Why did he say these things? So we'd know what he was going through. So we'd understand somewhat of the cost of following Jesus. There's a cross for you to bear. Sin had to be put away in order that you could bear a cross. You couldn't come back from this cross. Jesus could. Amen. Now you can bear a cross. So you can, you can, he, he's touched with the feeling of your infirmities. So he's given you something to do, to be touched with the feeling of his infirmity. Christ tread the wine press of the wrath of God alone, and it was for you on one side of the equation, but it was for God on the other. Amen. God, I want to briefly touch on this point that God did not make Jesus a sinner. It's fashionable in our day when, for men to imply that Jesus can fellowship with you in your sin. But that's a lie. Jesus can fellowship with you in your sin. If you insist on sinning, then you're going to have to do it without Jesus. Jesus came to take away sin. And if you're in him, then you've been given power to cease from sinning. Jesus is separate from sinners. For such a high priest became us who was holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners. 
The Living Bible says undefiled by sinners. You know, Jesus was the only one that could touch the beer of a, of a casket and, and, and come away with no sin. Anybody else touch that, they'd be what? They'd be defiled. But not Jesus. He was separate from sinners. Jesus is the only man who could be in the midst of sinners and it not have any effect on him as far as his personal character. Sin was never transferred to Jesus. He could go and eat into in a Pharisee's house or even a Gentile's house and no sin would be transferred to Jesus. Jesus came into the world by a different means than every other man. Even though Jesus was a man, he was the born of a woman, the seed of a woman. He was born of a virgin woman. See, the point I'm making is Jesus is not like every other man, and yet he's just like every other man. I'll go and learn what that means. This perfectly fits our need. He's separate from sinners. In other words, you can come to Jesus, you'll never defile him, and he'll make you all the better. See, Jesus, you come to Jesus and you confess your sins, and what will happen? He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, but he doesn't stop there. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, you know, I don't know the Greek on that, but when, when you come to Jesus and you confess your sins and he cleanses you from all unrighteousness, I believe that he's, he's cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And now, in that state of all unrighteousness being removed, can I dare say that at that moment I'm sinless? Well, if I'm not, then Jesus' work is ineffective. If Jesus can't take my sin away, then who can? He can take my sin away. Now, if any man sin... We have an advocate that's separate from sinners. In other words, you're never going to come to Jesus and contract any kind of sin disease. He's separate from sinners. You're always going to be the better for coming to Jesus because he's separate from sinners. You can't defile Jesus. Jesus tasted death, not sin. Jesus' body was the place where sin was placed on, his own body, who's, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So for that three-hour period, God laid sin on him. His body, his body bore sin. But it didn't change the character of Jesus because Jesus is separate from sinners. Couldn't defile him. In other words, put it like this. Jesus wasn't on the cross suffering the guilt from sinning. Jesus wasn't fearful that he wasn't going to raise from the dead because sin was on him, because he was doing the Father's will. He was taking away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's a difference between being made sin and being a sinner. Jesus' soul was the primary offering that God was going to make to sin, and it could not be defiled. Now, we know God's taught us, he's trained us what it takes to be an adequate sacrifice. It has to be spotless, right? Spotless. No, no kind of blemish whatsoever. Now here's Christ, he's a spotless lamb, he's perfect. God lays sin on him, but does it defile Jesus? No. He, he is an adequate sacrifice for sin. So what's the point? Why am I making this point? Christ cannot be touched with the feeling of sinning. I want to make this point because this needs to be made in the day we're living in. We have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. What's our infirmity? That we can still be tempted with evil. Amen. Now, if you'll deal with sin in the temptation stage, when you're tempted to sin, if you'll go to Jesus, he can be touched with that feeling. Amen. 
and he'll give you grace. You know what, Jesus? Jesus, every temptation has what? Has a door of escape. Has, there's a way of escape there. If you go to Jesus, he'll say, there it is right there. There's that way of escape. You just go that way. You just go that way, and you won't sin. If you don't, you're going to sin. James, James told us. Take the way of escape. James tells us that unless temptation is dealt with while it's in the temptation stage, it always gives birth to sin. Always. Well, Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, and he'll help us to not sin. Why? Because he's separate from sinners. See, he, it makes perfect sense when you, when you see what Christ is doing right now at the right hand of the majesty. And he's interceding for men. He's our helper in a time of need. Jesus, see, it, since Jesus never sinned, how could he have feelings for you if you sin? I, I, to me, it just it's, it's, see, it makes perfect sense. Jesus did not ever sin. Peter tells us, who did no sin. Now, if that was the only verse I had in the whole Bible, it would be enough. It would be enough. Jesus never sinned. That means that when he was on the cross and God laid sin on him, he wasn't defiled. Jesus never sinned. This has got to be the case. Otherwise, we got an unholy Christ. Not going to work. Jesus was not guilt-stricken. He wasn't gu guilty of sin. He never sinned. In fact, he despised the shame. Remember? He despised the shame. In other words, Jesus wasn't guilty of sin. And, and the very fact that he was there and men may have looked upon him, he despised the shame. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. Right? See, this, this didn't hinder Jesus at all. Amen. Jesus didn't care what men thought of him. He thought about what God thought of him. Amen. He was laying down his life. He was doing the Father's will. Jesus knew what was happening to him while he hung on the cross. And until we know what happened to him, well, we're not going to make a whole lot of progress. Jesus is our forerunner. He's our example of how we ought to live, how we ought to walk, how we ought to think, and how we ought to die. Yeah. See, the, he's, he's our forerunner. He's done it all. But he never sinned. See, that should tell us a lot. To tell us a lot about what the new birth is all about. The new birth is not about sinning. It's about dying to self so you don't have to sin anymore. He's our forerunner. He's taught us how to live unto God. Jesus submitted to being made sin, and I'm going to say primarily because of his love for God. Hebrews 10, 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Now, I'm not saying... I'm not implying that Jesus wasn't thinking of you. I'm implying that he wasn't thinking of you while he was dying on the cross. And, and, and I'm, you know, if, if that offends you, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sorry, and, and, but I'm not really. God had set a joy before Jesus, and I believe it. Man is too little of a joy. Yeah. Now follow me here because I think this is important. What, one thing that was great enough for him, God said something that was so great in front of him that it would constrain him to submit to being separated from God for a brief time. Now you know there came a time when Jesus was hanging on the cross when God turned, as it were, his face from him. We know that there was a time, and I'm not going to go in and preach the other brethren's sermons, but there was a time when God had to let him go. 
Now, I don't, I, I personally think it was a three-hour period. But he, this, is, this is what Jesus was drawing back from in the garden. This is Jesus sweating great drops. He didn't want to be separated from his father so bad that he sweated as it were great drops. Is there any other way, Father, that I can do this? I can complete your will without having to be separated from you because I've never been separated from you. I don't want to leave your presence. And he knew he had to. He knew it was required because God hates sin that much. He had to do it. And so Jesus submitted to doing the will of God and the Father comforted him just a little while, just a little while, and I'll raise you from the dead. Just a little while and you'll be at my right hand and I'll give you a name that's above every other name. Think of the glory that Jesus is in now. How, how, he's, a, he's by inheritance, by inheritance, he, by inheritance, has a better name. He's got a better inheritance. Why? Because he laid down his life. He did what the Father asked him to do. Yes, Lord. What happened? See, we're, we're all moved by incentives. Anybody who says they're not, well, they're just either they don't understand it or they're just outright lying. But we're all moved by some kind of incentive. God put an incentive so strong in front of Jesus Amen. that he went to the cross. Amen. He did it. Amen. Just like Jesus' work was a greater work, he had to have the greatest incentive. Right now, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality and powers, both in heaven and in earth and, and under the earth. He's right there next to God now. He has a name that's above every other name. He put all things. God has put all things under his feet. All things. The only thing that's accepted is God himself. This was a joy. This was an incentive that God put it in, 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 in front of Jesus. You do this work, son, and look what I'll do for you. Well, we're exhorted in Philippians 2.5 to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, whatever I'm going to read here now is the way Jesus thought. What kind of a mind was in Jesus? He's going to ask you to have the same kind of mind, so it would behoove us to know what kind of mind did Jesus operate by? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. This is something he did himself. He made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even the death on the cross, I didn't read anything in there about man. Did you? Did you, did you catch anything where Jesus was like on the cross thinking about you? Now, don't get me wrong. The eternal purpose of God has you in it, right? I mean, it does. doesn't the verse say, Brother Bob, doesn't the verse say for us? What I'm asking is who was the for us? Who, who was motivated for us? My Bible says it was God that was motivated for us. And the Son submitted to the Father's will to please the Father, which was working on our behalf. You can't have a better representative working for you than God. God made him to be sin for us. And he did it for God. Jesus doesn't work for nothing. You know, you wouldn't work for nothing. How many of you would get up and go to work for nothing? Well, I guess some people would, but Jesus didn't. Jesus, it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Well, 
I know it's, it's popular for people to say, well, if it had just been one. Jesus would have died if there was just one. Would Jesus have laid down his life and submitted to being made sin for one person? I say this is foolish to even think like this. Amen. God promised that he would highly exalt him, highly exalt him, and give him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. Now, I'm going to say that, that this was compelling to Jesus. This was compelling to Jesus. You know, you say, well, Son, even the ones that don't believe on you, even the ones that are going to be cast into the lake of fire, they're going to come and they're going to get down on their knees and they're going to bow down to you. Every knee is going to bow. And what are they going to say? What are they going to say? That at the name of every Jesus, and Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Amen. to the glory of God. See, they're going to come before Christ, and they're going to all admit, I, I should have believed in you. I should have. I should have believed in you. But do you see my point? This was an incentive for Jesus. This is how Jesus' mind reasoned when he was hanging on the cross. Just a little while. Just a brief moment. Just a brief moment. And yet, you know how suffering is. It doesn't seem like a brief moment. It was just a brief moment at the tree, wasn't it? For Adam and Eve there, just a brief moment. But look what happened in a brief moment. Jesus is hanging on the tree, and at that moment, he trusted in God. He trusted that God was going to do. He was going to give him the things that he had promised. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. Now, you know, this is very applicable to us. Right now, you're in a moment of trouble, aren't you? You're, you're like a cake that's half baked you've got part of you that's holy and righteous and, and and wants to do the will of god but that isn't the only part you've got but just as sure as he's given you the the down payment he's going to give you the rest of it someday Amen. you know that's true because jesus is seated at the right hand of god if god god it, he gave him what he promised well he'll give you what he promised too Jesus was thinking about a better inheritance. Well, God made Jesus' soul an offering for sin. Now, see, like I already said, the, our, 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 our text for today says, for us. Now, you know, God, salvation is, he's bringing many sons to glory, right? Isn't this his eternal purpose? They're being transformed into the image of his son. And someday they're going to be the habitation of God. God himself is going to dwell with them. Well, look at, look at the way God's done this. He's already made you righteous. Well, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this, this transaction's already occurred. We're sitting here today, and Christ has already been made sin, Right? He's not going to be made. He already, he, the work's completed. And yet, there's a part of it that's not completely complete yet. You're made the righteousness of God, but it's in him. Yeah. And now anyone who would say they're absolutely 100% in him, well, I don't believe that's true. I don't know. The, how could you? I, I'm not completely in him yet. I got this body. As soon as the purchased possession is, I move into my eternal body, then I'll be in him completely. And so my point is that, see, he's divulged this, opened this up to us right now, that this is the transaction that occurred between him and God. Okay, he, God made him to be sin that he might make us, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, yes, as surely... As the first part's 100% completed, the second part's going to be 100% completed. Very Well, we could say very soon. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And this reconciliation had to be able to stand up in the courts of heaven. Yeah. 
This death, it had to be just and it had to be righteous. And it was without fault. And on that day when you stand before God and he sees no spot in you, no, no wrinkle at all, then the righteousness of God will be realized to its fullness at that point in time. Now we have, we have the first fruits, right? We, we, we are being made the righteousness of God, all right? And yet, who would stand up and say, I'm 100% righteous? Well, by faith you are. By faith you are. He, he promised it, and so by faith you are the righteous of God, but experientially, that part's got to be dealt with, is my point. We've got to have to have this, this, this body, this likened to the body of Christ. Then God can move in. Now, it's, now we have the Holy Spirit. We do have the Holy Spirit. But then God himself will dwell with us. Being made the righteous of God. Now, notice it doesn't say, I'm probably running out of time. It doesn't say, that were made the righteousness of Christ. It's the righteousness of God. And it says that way for, for a reason. Christ was righteous. There's no doubt about that. We know that because he was raised from the dead. Christ was absolutely righteous. And yet it doesn't say that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. It's the righteousness of God. For therein, and of course you can go through, all, through scripture. There's a lot of references to this. The righteousness, Romans 1, 17, this is the gospel message now. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. It was right for God to do this. It was right for God to, to make Jesus sin in order that we might be made the righteousness of God. This whole thing was right. And, and you know, when you stand before him, not one personality would be able to, to voice a, 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 a disparaging word against your righteousness. It'll be the righteousness of God. In him. That's what it'll be. Satan himself won't be able to lift up a voice and say, yeah, but remember where they were. They're not there anymore. He took it all away. And now you stand before him, the righteousness of God in him. For therein, it was right for God to make Jesus sin. It was right. But now, now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, be witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all them that believe, to everyone that believes the record that God's given of us, and everyone that God's given the Christ, everyone that's in him is righteous. Otherwise, God couldn't have anything to do with you now. But he does have something to do with you, doesn't he? We all know that there's, we've come from one degree of, of righteousness to another degree of righteousness. We've come, when we first came into Christ, there's things that I didn't even know were wrong. I had no idea they were wrong, but God didn't smite me down, did he? He says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. So God's leading us, transforming us to where one day we'll be able to be clothed with the righteousness of God and know what's going on. The righteousness of God is only found in Christ Jesus. You will never, ever in the history of the world, find any righteous of God being any other place than the person of Christ Jesus. See, God had to have an environment where his righteousness could even be realized. This, this environment is in Christ, in his son. Now, he's the one, technically, he's the one that God is pleased with. I think this point needs to be made. If you're going to be the righteous of God, it's going to have to occur in him. Because, um, quite frankly, he's the one that God's happy with. He's the one that has pleased the Father. The, the Father's always been pleased with him. And so, see, he's... Ephesians 1, 3, and I, I'm not going to read all, all of this, but, but it's amazing to me how many times, if you're talking about in him now, how many times the reference in this first 10, 13 verses is reference to in Christ or in him, to himself, his grace, in the bullet, to in whom he hath abounded, his will, his good pleasure, 
It's all about him. And what we just got done talking about is all, this is God's brainstorm, speaking as a man. God set out to make himself known. And what we're witnessing in this verse is how he did it. He made Christ to be sin so that he could divulge things about his character that he couldn't, couldn't divulge any other way. But he did it. And he put it all in this, all the, the goodness, all the, all the blessings are all in him. Which means that Christ is the environment where righteousness can reign. That's, that's where it is. It doesn't occur any other place. Well, I'm going to end there, brother. I thank you for your patience with me and pray that God will bless those words.